Thank you, Father Bolton. Um, um, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and just to, um, to make a few um, um, remarks in advance. Uh, I originally um, uh, was having lunch. Of course, I have periodical lunches with our Father Bozeman. And um, we were talking, I want to say it was back in uh, November or October. And I asked him what, they, what you guys were going to, what the church was going to do for Black History Month. And I asked him, was there any way possible I could be a part of it? Um, uh, me and my family moved here from Charleston, South Carolina in 2016. Um, we, we bounced around kind of looking for the right spot, the right church for us. Um, I had previously, Father Bolton probably doesn't even remember, I previously met him a couple of years prior to that. They had a men's conference in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I remember there was a bus that drove up and all these black men got off the bus. And, and of course, I flew in with Arthur McFarland and different nights uh, in Charleston. And, uh, and I saw Father Bolton get off the bus with his entourage. <laughs> and, um, um, and I had a chance to hear him speak. So, so when we moved here from South Carolina, um, and I found out which church Father Bozeman was pastoring, I told my wife and my daughters I want to go to the church to, to, to see if this was a good fit for us. Of course, it was an excellent fit for us. So we, so we live in the West Bank, but we drive all the way over here. Um, my wife, Rebecca, is, um, uh, is a lector. My uh, daughter, uh, Leah, is the youngest uh, Eucharistic minister. Um, I'm an usher. Um, and it took us a couple of years to get uh, involved, but that's the same thing we did in Charleston. So, um, thank you, Father Bozeman, for allowing me to do this, to be part of the church family, and, uh, and, and like you pointed out, share my knowledge and, and my gift. Um, I also want to thank Ms. Marlene Wilson also, because we had conversations about the presentation and if it was appropriate for young people and that sort of thing, and it is. Um, I've given this lecture. Um, throughout the United States. I've, I've done it at the National uh, KPC Convention. Um, I'm, like Father Bolton mentioned, I, I'm teaching a class right now, and I taught this class on a regular basis at the Citadel Military College, where I was, where I was there for 15 years. Um, so um, this is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, before I get into my lecture, I do want to make a few comments, because uh, on, on many occasions that me and Father Bolton go to lunch, and we have lots of great conversations, and one conversation he always sort of brings up to me, um, or he makes reference to, which kind of bothers me a little bit. And that is, of course, we all know, Father Bozeman um, is very passionate. He likes to talk about um, uh, systemic issues and problems in our community. Um, and a lot of times, people tend to not be as supportive. Um, or say, he talks about race too much. Or he talks about um, politics too much. Um, I, I, I have issues with that, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Because Father Bozeman, in my mind, is following in the legacy of great clergy leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King, yes. like, um, um, is it uh, Father Clements, um, um, and, and other leaders. And as you know, that, that Political activism in the black community has always started in the church. Amen. And the church and, and the church leaders are the ones who highlight those injustices. And so um, when Father Bozeman is talking about racism, discrimination, injustice, um, social oppression, economic inequality, disenfranchisement, what he's doing is doing what he's supposed to do. Because if we can't come to church and talk about immorality and things that are unethical, where can we talk about them? Amen. And, and if, if, if pastors and church leaders like Father Bozeman can't do this, then what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to feed the congregation spiritually, but also in many other ways. Yes. And so that leadership that he exhibits and the fact that he talks about um, the divider-in-chief and other individuals who are doing things that are immoral that's, in my mind, what he should be doing. That's why my family chose St. Raymond St. Leo, and, and that's how I feel fulfilled when I come to church. So I would just say this, Father, please do not stop doing what you do Amen. and offering your gifts to the community. Amen. Amen. And not just being live stream, because I want everybody to hear this. This is really important. Um, I want to tell you just very little about myself before I move on to the presentation. 
Uh, I'm originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Southern University. Um, I, I received a, a master, I mean, a, a marketing degree um, from Southern and a, a master's degree in history. Um, I received my PhD from Northwestern in Chicago. Um, and then when I left there, I went to the Citadel Military College for 15 years. There I received my MBA. Um, I, I chose the Citadel Military College because my um, expertise um, and what I write on, and I have a book um, about the history of military training programs at black colleges, is I focus on African American military history. And so, and I'm one of the few African Americans who, who do that. Um, so uh, when I had an opportunity to come to Xavier, I was really excited <coughs> for an opportunity to come home, but also to work at an HBCU. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's sort of my background and how I've gotten interested in this particular subject. So let me go ahead and start. Um, and this does have some time and time, and I apologize. <coughs> there we go. All right. So <coughs> when, when I... Sorry. <coughs> when I start talking about um, the history of mass incarceration, um, it's very, very important to me that individuals in the community, individuals in general, understand the history of this. What tends to happen more often than not is that when we talk about mass incarceration, when we talk about <coughs> the criminal justice system, a lot of times, because people don't know the history, they assume that police brutality, uh, police using excessive force, um, excessive um, high um, um, sentencing of African Americans are things that are not necessarily the norm. Hmm. Um, and that's just not true. As a matter of fact, I, I really like, and of course I didn't have anything to do with the, the theme of this year's Black History Month, Breaking the Change, I really love that theme. because. Uh, in my mind, when you say breaking something, um, it, it usually involves a physical act. But on the other hand, I look at breaking the chains from a sort of a, a, a mental or an intellectual act. And I always tell my students, knowledge is power. And in order to break something, you need power. And so for me, and my contributions, or at least what I like to tell my students, I want you to understand the history of this very important topic. Because what it does is when we start talking about solutions, when we start talking about how do we address these problems, if you, if you approach it that this is an isolated incident and this doesn't happen too often, it really impacts how you approach the problem. But if you recognize that this is a, a, a systemic problem that's been around for 200 years, the way you approach it is going to be vastly different. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because when I was in Charleston, I used to teach this particular class. And, and every other week, I would, we would see on the new, national news that a unarmed black man or woman was shot by the police. And in every time, of course, the, the Citadel is a predominantly white male military college. Most of my students were white males. And unfortunately, a lot of them would pretty much think that these were all isolated incidents. And it pretty much reflected that a police officer was a bad police officer. But what they didn't realize is that this has been the black experience from the very, very beginning. So what I did was, and the kind of professor that I am, I like to teach classes that I think are valued and relevant to the community. I would go around campus and ask students, what do you want to learn about? And then I would develop my class around them. Not, I'm going to teach what I want, and you just have to take it or not take it. That's not very valuable. So that's the reason why I started with talking about this subject and doing research. So to, to move forward, and, we, and I'm, I'm a history professor, so we go from the very, very beginning. There's something called the terrible transformation. And what that usually reflects is that a time period in the black experience in American history where things turned or trans transformed in a very negative way. So first thing I want to point out, we're usually taught that African Americans came here or Africans came to America in 1619 and they came as slaves. That's not true. And there's no truth in it. Um, the, the black experience started when Africans came here in 1619, but they were not slaves. And the reason why they were not slaves was because slavery did not exist. So you can't be a slave if the institution is not, doesn't exist. 
the, the type of labor that was, that was predominant at that time was called indentured servitude. Indentured servitude meant that you came to the, to the America or the colonies, and as, passage, as payment for passage to, to America, you had to work for somebody for something like seven years. And at that end of that seven years, you were released from your contract, you were given land, and then you could be a landowner yourself. So when the first Africans came here in 1619, they were not slaves, they were indentured servants. And just like everybody else, when, when their contract ended, they were released from their contract, they were given property, and they became landowners, and guess what? They also employed indentured servants, white and black. And this was the first experience of black people. <clears throat> um, that lasted for about approximately 20 years. Now, the terrible transformation started when there were three indentured servants in Virginia that ran away from their, their employer, so to speak. One was Irish, one was Scottish, and one was African. Now, keep in mind that poor people have more in common than not. So what you would find more often than, than, than anything that you would have um, indentured servants that would marry one another, they would congregate with each other, they would interact with each other. They didn't do it with wealthy people, no matter what color they were, because that's their social state. So these individuals decided to run away and break their contracts. When they were caught, their sentencing was, for the Irishman, he was given an extra two years added to his, his sentence, or his, his contract. For the, for the Scottish individual, he was also given an extra two years for, for, for his offense. For the African, his penalty was he was enslaved for life. Hmm. Wow. That was the very first person in, in America, a, a black person, that became a slave. Now, understand the symbolism behind this. The slavery in this country started as a form of punishment for a black man, which was excessive. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the criminal justice system in this country, and the fact that it has always been uneven, and always been immoral and unethical, mm -hmm. the fact that you have slavery, it starts as, as a form of a punishment for a crime. So what happens is that this is in 1640 and this is in Virginia. <clears throat> now, if you know anything about the American colonies and American history, all of the colonies were very different. They weren't unified. So it was almost like they were their separate countries. And they could come up with their own laws. So the terrible transformation takes place, whereas slowly and surely, each of the colonies start to implement similar policies to enslave black people on a permanent basis. So it starts in Virginia. Then maybe a few years later, it's in New Jersey, and then a few years later, it's in uh, South Carolina. Then it could be in uh, Rhode Island. So this takes place over a matter of maybe 20 years. But what you have during this particular period is you have free black people who own property. Mm -hmm. And now what you're really doing is not only are you possibly enslaving them, you certainly are enslaving their children and their grandchildren. So this is why, this is how slavery started in, in America, because it started as a punishment for a crime. And it was excessive. The three individuals commit the same crime, but one of those individuals' crime is treated vastly differently. And so that's really, really, really important to understand, because as we talk about the criminal justice system and mass incarceration, you have to understand that African Americans have always been specifically targeted for excessive punishments. Now, if you obviously want to know, well, why is that the case? It's because at that particular time, there was a huge labor demand and shortage in the colonies. And that indentured servitude wasn't working for a lot of the owners. Because every time someone was freed, you had to get someone else. Then you had to give them land. In order to be wealthy and to be profitable, you need a sustainable <coughs> form of cheap labor that always is consistent. That's the only way that you can make money. So this was a way to, to, to maintain a labor, cheap labor source, and also Africans were the perfect target. And the reason why is, is because they're, they're outsiders. 
they are different. It's not. It's very easy to do, to look to see who an African is because they look differently. And not only that, because they're outsiders and they're not from America, they don't know the land like a Native American could run away um, or even come back with lots of his cousins and friends. That's not the case with Africans. They're 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 transplanted or, or kidnapped from another country. They're perpetual outsiders. They do not speak the language. So they're, they're easy targets. And that's how slavery started and it was built. But uh, again, remember, it was based on a crime. So between 1640 and 1860, in the, the institution of slavery had many forms. Now, most of us, if I ask you to, to, to describe slavery, you're going to probably describe plantation slavery. But plantation slavery was only one form of slavery. There's municipal slavery. Does anybody have an idea what municipal slavery might cover? What's that? Business transactions. Well, when you think of municipalities, you think of cities. This, this means that the city of Savannah owned slaves, not individuals. The city of Charleston owned slaves. The city of New Orleans owned slaves. So, and the type of work they would do would be work like sanitation, picking up trash or dead animals, or whatever you want to call it. But what I want you to understand is that there are many forms of slavery, not just plantations. So, so cities could own slaves. Also, there was something called urban slavery. Urban slavery is a form of slavery where slaves live within the city. They don't live on plantations. A really great example of that is Denmark Vesey. Everybody's hopefully vaguely familiar with Denmark Vesey, who tried to uh, plan the slave insurrection in Charleston. Um, it was discovered, obviously, by a black person telling, telling white people uh, what was going on, and they rounded them up and they killed them all. Denmark Vesey was, well, technically, he was a free person. He lived on his own. Well, let me back up. Originally, he was owned by somebody. And he had his own house, and he lived apart from his master, which might sound kind of odd. So someone owns him, but he doesn't live with his master. He lives away from his master, and he lives in his own home. But the labor that he produced, he was a very well-known carpenter. And so many wealthy people would come to him and say, we want you to build this and build that or whatever. But the money that he produced was given back to his slave master. But his slave master was smart enough to say, I'm going to have to break him off a little bit because if I don't, he's not going to want to do the work. So what he did was he, allowed, he gave money to Denmark Vesey, but Denmark Vesey gave the vast majority to the, to the slave owner. And eventually, Denmark Vesey, he won the lottery and he, he bought his freedom from his owner. So in, in urban slavery, you have slaves who live in the city and they perform work within the city. And, and they don't live in a plantation uh, an environment. Perfect example. If you was to go into, and I will use Charleston because that's where I came from prior to this. If, if you go into Charleston downtown in 1840, and, you, and if you've ever been to Charleston, there's the market area, and there's all these places that you can buy stuff. What you would see was you would walk there, <coughs> and you would see black people walking around, talking, laughing, congregating with each other. No one has balls and chains on them. They're walking around very freely. What you would not be able to determine is who's free and who's a slave. Because these individuals are talking whatever, and what they're doing is they're running errands, they're buying things for their slave masters, they purchase the groceries or whatever it is, they bring it back and they cook and that kind of thing. But it's, it's slavery in an urban environment. Industrial slavery is also a little different. Industrial slavery means that you have corporations, and you've kind of heard of this before, corporations who purchase slaves. <clears throat> so what corporations are going to purchase slaves? Individuals or corporations that, that are labor intensive, working on the railroad, working in coal mines, clearing swamps. Those, those corporations are in industries that need manual labor. So they're going to also purchase slaves too. So this is really, really important because of all four of these forms of slavery, the one that's closely connected to mass incarceration is the last one. It's industrial slavery. So 
Moving all the way up to the 1860s, you have the Civil War, you have the Emancipation uh, Proclamation, and the, the war ends, and, and all slaves are free. Now, when all the slaves are free, what emancipation does is it destroys the social control system that's afforded by the institution of slavery. So keep in mind, slavery is also a social control system. What it does is it regulates what black people can and can't do, where they can go, who they can talk to, all of those sort of things. And as we know, there were lots of laws that did that. Those laws were called slave codes. And the slave codes would be very specific laws only to black people. And it, what it said was that they, could either, they couldn't go to certain places, they had to be in by dark, if they did certain things, especially any offense to a white person, literally would mean death. If you struck one, a white person, out of anger, you could be killed. If you raised your voice to them, you could be killed. If you assaulted them in any way, even verbally, you could be killed. So these are laws that are designed to socially control black people. But now slavery is abolished, you don't have any laws like that. That's going to be a problem. Also, when you think about what happens at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, the, 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 predominantly the war was fought in the South, which means that after the Civil War, the, war the, the South is pretty much destroyed. It has to be rebuilt, and it has to be rebuilt with labor. So now the, the issue or the concern is how do you rebuild the South um, without paying for the labor? So that, that's one of the major considerations. The other thing is, as you already know, um, after slavery was abolished, you have African Americans who are now free. What does freedom mean? If I ask everybody in this room what does freedom mean to you in most cases, you're going to tell me something different. But in most cases, what freedom meant to most slaves was they wanted the ability to move around where they wanted to, they wanted to see their families, they wanted to get married, they wanted to worship um, the way they wanted to, and so that's what freedom means to them. Now, many people get the impression that after slavery was abolished, many African Americans were able to pack up and leave. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, Slavery is abolished on a Monday, and guess what? On Friday, the slaves are pretty much living in the same place, doing the same thing, working for the same person. And the reason why is, where are you going to go? You don't own any property. You don't own any livestock. The only way that you're going to be able to go somewhere is like my, my godfather used to tell me, using Mo and Joe. <laughs> So how far are you going to get walking? And keep in mind, some of these individuals, they have families. So you're going to take your family and y'all just going to walk? And where are you going to go? One of the places I'm going to tell you that you're probably not going to go, contrary to belief, is that you're not going to the north. Because they kill black people up there. And the reason why they do is because what people in the north did not want is former slaves coming up to the north and taking their jobs. Now. I often tell my students when I'm talking about the past, it's really, really important for them to make a connection to the present. Because I'm not talking about the past, really. I'm really talking about the present. Mm -hmm. So when I say stuff like people are worried about black people coming and taking their jobs, what do you think about? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And this whole myth about people coming from uh, South America and Mexico, and they're going to uh, rampage our cities and take all of our wonderful jobs. <laughs> that, that's not true. But that's always been um, a myth, and I'm saying it nicely, to perpetuate oppressing those individuals. Mm -hmm. So if black people can't go up north, you need a lot to go the out, out west. When I say a lot, you need to have transportation, you need to have food. And if you don't have any of those things, then literally where are you going to go? You're not going to go anywhere. What you're going to do is you're going to go up to the big house and you're going to renegotiate your terms with, with the master. But I'll be honest with you, essentially, you're still doing the work of a slave. You're still living in the same conditions of a slave. And really, you're still enslaved. So one of the things that um, I like to point out to my students is that slavery con continued after 1865. We are taught 
that slavery was abolished in 1865. That's not true. Slavery continued probably all the way up to maybe the, the early 20th century. It was slavery by another name. Right. And I'll, I'll point that out in a minute. So, going back to the abolition of slavery, everybody's familiar with the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, correct? I always ask my students, tell me what is the 13th Amendment, what does it say? Tell me what the 14th Amendment says and what the 15th Amendment says. And I like to kind of watch them squirm for a minute or two. Uh, the 13th Amendment, it was focused on the abolition of slavery. Now, this is really, really interesting because it has a strong connection to um, mass incarceration. It reads, neither slave nor in involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. So what the 13th Amendment said that freed black people was all black people are free except if you commit a crime. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. Remember, the, the first black man in America was made a slave based on a crime. There's that loophole that politicians always find in these bills. The 14th Amendment gave people, the, black people, citizenship rights. <clears throat> the 15th Amendment um, gave black people the right to vote. Now, you might wonder, and I often tell my students, why are there so many civil rights bills? Why is there a, a civil rights bill, and literally you have civil rights bills starting from that particular point, really going up to the day. But as we already know the, how politics works, when someone puts forth a bill, it's always negotiated and debated, and then people kind of wear it down, and they do this and that or whatever. Those civil rights bills continue to, to exist because they always fall short of doing other things. So that's why, for instance, you, you would think, well, why don't you have voting rights and also citizenship in the 13th Amendment? So you don't have to keep doing it. Because that's the reason why. So that's really, really important. <clears throat> so, after 1865, slaves are technically free. You have um, municipal slavery and industrial slavery that are really the foundation to, to, to maintaining slavery in the South. You also have something called black codes that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. You have racial stereotypes. And then you also have the fact that black people are disproportionately poor, poorer than white people. Hmm. So these are all things that contributed to the, to the existence of mass incarceration and the continuance of slavery in this country. So young people, when you're in class, if your teacher says that slavery it was abolished in 1865, tell them, no, that is not true. <laughs> it continued. And it continued well into the 20th century. Because what happens is, if we start to believe, and it's propagated that black men are violent, that black men commit crimes, that all these negative racial stereotypes about black people are so strong, the sad part about it is, not only will white people believe it, but black people will believe it too. That's right, that's right. Okay. And, and it's by design. And it, and it leads me to another point, whether you want to believe it or not. But at least it's been argued that um, based on how Russian propaganda works, that if you consistently tell a lie, eventually people will believe it. Mm -hmm. yes. Marinate on that one, right? Mm -hmm. All right. But there's some truth to it. Because I'll be honest with you, after a while, if someone just keeps lying to you, at some point you might say, I wonder if that's true. <laughs> you know, because you're going to try to make sense out of nonsense. My point is that's how racial stereotypes work. If you keep propagating them and pushing them and pushing them, not only will the people who you want to believe it, but other people will start to believe it. So, black codes. Now this is really, really important. I mentioned to you earlier that there's something called slave codes. Slave codes were laws that regulated the mobility of slaves, what they can and can't do. Well now you don't have technically slaves. So what happens is, after 1865, but around 1867, 1868, when Democrats start taking control back of the state governments from the Republicans, and that's an, almost another lecture, <laughs> what they started doing was trying to figure out a way to re-enslave black people. 
And the way they did it was, remember, the 13th Amendment said you can enslave somebody, but, they, it, had, but it had to be a criminal who broke the law. So these laws that were enacted on a state and local level, they focused primarily on criminalizing black life. So what I mean by that is, just the, the title of this slide is Black Men Equals Criminal. So when, a, when a, a white person or even a black person saw a black man, what they were supposed to think that this person is a criminal. And it, and it, and it sort of reminds you even today, for instance, when you've seen maybe uh, cartoons, caricatures, or even statements about, well, this black person was, was stopped by the police. Well, what was his crime? He was driving while being black, too. Mm -hmm. Automatically, I see somebody black in a car, and I'm like, that person probably committed a crime. What are they doing driving this car? Why are they dressed so nice? What's going on with this particular person? All automatically, they are assumed to have committed a crime or be a criminal. The reason why that happens today is because of this. So, in 1867, there was something called black codes. These were laws that criminalized black life. So what does that mean? That means that any black person that was using obscene language you could be arrested and you could be put in jail at hard labor. Any black person um, that was considered to be a vagrant. Vagrancy was de described or defined as an individual who did not have a job. And you had to work for somebody white. Think about it for a second. So unless you can prove that you were self-employed and you owned your own business, you had to work for somebody. And, you, and if, you don't, if you don't own land, you can't work for yourself. So what they would do literally is, if they found out the law that you were not working for a white person, they can arrest you for that. And they can put you in jail, and it can be anywhere for months to years. Loitering. That's when, obviously, when people are congregating and talking. And you've heard of the statement that, for instance, uh, people would still make little jokes that you have more than three black people talking at, a, at the water cooler. It's like, y'all gonna break that up because uh, people are gonna get nervous. Too many of y'all are talking. Literally, if a black, black men were congregating and talking with one another in groups, that could, is also an offense. And they can come and arrest you for that. So what you're what you starting to see is that you're being really arrested because you're black not for really committing a crime, because everybody else does these things. Selling cotton after sunset. Why is that interesting? Because the black people who did own their property, they had contracts uh, um, to sell their product to white people. But a lot of times, white people would give them so little dollars that they would try to sell their product on the sly after dark. Because someone would say, look, that person's messing over you. I'll give you more money. Well, you couldn't break your contract with him. Mm. So you would say, well, I'll meet you later on. If they caught you doing that, you're going to jail. Mm. Black men were not supposed to carry weapons. Now, I always tell my students this. All laws are in reference are in response to something else. So why do you think that black men were not able to carry guns? Because they used them on white people. And they would shoot them. It's the honor of God too. So w the way you disarm them is say that there's a law that you can't carry a gun. Everybody else can carry a gun, but not y'all. You can go to jail for that. Violating your contract, bigamy, obviously having more than one wife, and then also being caught in an illicit affair with someone white. Uh, obviously that did not include white males. So what these laws do are doing is it criminalizes you for just being black. You could be walking on the sidewalk, and if you do not step out into the street when white people pass, you could be arrested for that. When I told my students that, it's been documented that what black people have even been arrested for laughing too loud in public. Oh my God. They couldn't believe it. I said, I'm not lying to you guys, I'm being honest. So what I want you guys to understand is that the, the reason why there are so many black people in prison, and you have mass incarceration, and that these criminal sentences have always been excessive and extreme is because historically that's the way it was. 
but the purpose was to re-enslave black people, put them back in, in a subservient role, and, and use their, their labor to the benefit of the majority community. Now, this is really, really important because what people tend to think is that negative stereotypes of African Americans developed primarily before the Civil War started. And that's not necessarily true. Most of the negative stereotypes that we have, or most people propagate about black people, were pretty much after, was done after the Civil War, not before. Think about it for a second. I'll give you a quick, a good example. Let's say you have the um, um, Sambo. Sambo was supposed to be a black person that was lazy and lethargic, and they didn't want to work. Well, it doesn't make any sense for that stereotype to be predominant before the Civil War, during slavery, because think about it. Who could run a plantation with a, with a group of Sambos working for them? You would never make any money, because they don't work, right? Now, the, the stereotype became predominant after the Civil War. Why? Because there was an attempt to re-enslave black people put them in those same type of conditions, and they resist it. So then that's how you have the stereotype, oh, they're lazy, they don't want to work. When you look at the coon, the coon was supposed to be, tech, originally it was supposed to be zip coon. That's a negative stereotype, ladies and gentlemen, that was not about African, African Americans in the South. It was a stereotype that was about African Americans in the North. And the reason why was because in the North, you had free black people. It was about a free black person who acted like they were white. And because they were uneducated, they didn't speak good English, what you found was this individual was someone who was always trying to act more intelligent than what they were. Hmm. And so it was called Zip Coon. And then, of course, in the South, it was called Coon. The one that's more applicable to our conversation is the brute. The brute is a negative stereotype that really says that black men are violent and black men, black men are criminals. But the one that's most closely connected to that particular stereotype was the myth of the black rapist. And the myth of the black rapist said that black men were out attacking white women every time they saw it. And so um, in order for you to, to maintain order, it gave law enforcement the right and the ability to not only arrest a black man, but murder them, lynch them, put them on fire, do all these sort of heinous, horrible things. But when you look at the data, less than 1% of African American men were ever, had ever commit or, uh, committed or attempted to rape a white female. But if you look at the statistics on the other side in terms of white men, it was predominant. Mm. So these stereotypes have meaning. So the first one, obviously, and of course, um, is supposed to be the Mammy, and y'all might recognize Hattie McDaniel, the first black person to win the Academy Award. Yes. Very smart woman, very well educated. Um, you have to the right here is the group. Here's the black man who's um, chasing after the white woman. You have at the very bottom the Pickening. That was a, a, a stereotype that was supposed to um, to highlight or, 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 or describe black children as being subhuman. And that meant if you looked at them and they were subhuman, then, then you could do anything you want to them. Uh, and you could treat them any way you wanted. All of these stereotypes have very pronounced and strong meaning, but they have purpose. They just don't happen. The one at the very bottom um, is a minstrel. So you have menstrual shows where you have white men that are dressing up in black face. And what they're doing is they're, they're supposedly acting like black people, but they're doing it in a way for comic relief for white audiences. So they're, they're exaggerating their emotions. They're, they're dancing. They're singing. They're, they're bumbling under their, their words and not speaking clearly. All the negative stereotypes that, that people want you to believe about black people. And guess what? They're making a whole lot of money at doing that. Mm -hmm. So all of these negative stereotypes have an impact on the incarceration rate and how black men are being uh, arrested. So I'll give you an example. 
Landon Broomfield was a black man convicted of a property crime in Green County, Georgia in 1870. Although burglary carried I'm sorry, a maximum of 20 years, Broomfield received only five. Well, I guess that's not bad. Now, let me, say, let me say a couple of things about this. A lot of the crimes that black men are being arrested for in the 1870s, 1880s, 90s, early 20th century are property crimes. Who are property crimes most associated with? What segment of the population? Poor people. Property crimes mean that you're stealing property. Property could be anything. It could be a pig, a chicken, it could be anything. So when you look at even today, in 2020, when, when if a poor person is going to steal, it's going to probably be something like clothing, food, the things that they need. Black people, remember, are disproportionately more poor than white people. So, are they, are they probably um, committing more crimes? It's a possibility. But what you find is that because these property crimes are happening, black men are getting these excessive criminal sentencing. Also, keep in mind, there are a lot more poor white people in the South than there is black people that are poor. All right? So, in the neighboring county, Oglethorpe County, William Sampson, Sampson had also been convicted of the same crime. Although he was sentenced to three years in prison, he never arrived to the penitentiary. Because unlike Broomfield, Sam, Simpson was white and he received a pardon from the governor. Now, it's not like he's the cousin of the governor, or they good buddies, it's that he's white. And someone petitioned on his behalf, it could have been the local sheriff. So what you find is that, and statistically, white people commit more crimes than black people, then and today. Right now. But, right now. But their sentencing has always been different. But it's done that way to stigmatize black people on purpose. All right? So we're moving along. Landon Broomfield and William Simpson exemplify the very different worlds that black and white men inhabited after the Civil War. The system of punishment which Georgia shared with other southern states involved the lease of virtually every convict to a private party. White men rarely encountered working for leases. So, <clears throat> I mentioned to you earlier that industrial slavery was most connected to mass incarceration. The, the, there's a, a, a strong effort to re-enslave black men to get them to do the same type of labor that they did while they were slaves. And the way to do that is, once they commit a crime, remember the 13th Amendment said that you can re-enslave them, essentially. So, once you criminalize black life, and you round up black men for standing around, or not working for someone, or breaking their contracts, there was even, there was even black codes that said that black people could not be out after dark. If they catch you after dark, or better yet, just like when I was growing up, my mom and them would tell me and my brothers, Get home before that street light comes on. So, and you know the street light was, was, was it came on based on uh, the, light, the light outside. So if a black person was headed home and it was getting dark, you could be arrested. And that was a way to, to arrest black men. And then what would happen would be that a person would come from, let's say, the Cox Railroad Corporation. He would go to the local sheriff and say, I need about 10 workers. Well, I picked any one, 10 or one of those persons right over in there. They would pull them out of the jail. The person from Cox Railroad would pull out his pocket. He would give money to the sheriff. And the sheriff would say, take them. They each one of them have to work for you for three to five years at hard labor. <coughs> and that, those individuals would work for those companies and they would live in the most deplorable conditions. On average, I think it's something like 40 to 60 percent of those individuals died before their sentencing was up. And so that's what I mean about by convict lease system and also um, how slavery continued. Between 1870 and 1940, the convict population had changed little. The vast majority of men admitted to the penitentiary were black, and over 60 percent have been convicted of property crimes. Remember, that means that those individuals are poor. Today, Broomfield and Simpson whites are still less likely to be admitted to the penitentiary, and if admitted, could still expect to receive more lenient treatment. 
This is a very important slide because what it highlights is that the level of, uh, of incarceration for black men always corresponded to the economy. So again, think about that for a second. So, between 1870 and 1875, the incarceration rate doubled. Between 1890 and 1893, it doubled again. And then between 1926 and 1932. But it plummeted during World War I. And if you look at each one of those dates or time periods, what you find is during that time period, there was an economic recession or depression. So what does that mean? That means that when the economy goes bad, it's harder to find jobs, right? That means that whites, poor whites, will have to compete more with poor blacks. So when the economy goes bad, they start arresting more black men to remove them from the economy to give whites a, an unfair advantage. It changes during World War I because you need lots of men. So they're not arresting a whole lot of people. So this is not necessarily being based just on crime. It's based on the economy. And what this means is, as we already know, you're talking about white privilege. You're talking about um, uh, the fact that we don't live in a fair and equitable society. And that black men have always been a barrier, at least to, in many people's minds, in terms of jobs and opportunities. So if I have to compete with these individuals, then that means that it's unfair. So we need to figure out a way to remove them from, from, from society so we have those jobs. Again, going back to today, the same type of rhetoric as it relates to people coming across the border. They're going to take my job. We don't want them over here. Oh, by the way, they're rapists. They're murderers. They're criminals. There's enough crime committed by people in this country that it's not impacted greatly by anybody else. And statistically, I, I have my doubts about that. But again, it's the same type of rhetoric. So during the, the uh, early phase of American capitalism, in order to, for the merchant capitalists to increase productivity, they added convicts to the labor pool. Therefore, the role of prisons was part and parcel of the accumulation of capital by the private sector. Hard labor for private profit was therefore an essential attribute to all penitentiaries. So what that means is that corporations depended on convict labor in order to enrich themselves. Not to mention, what you're going to find is, at this particular point, you have penitentiaries for profit. Does that sound familiar? That's when I tell my students, guys, look, we're not talking about the, the, uh, the, pres the past. We're talking about the present. Amen. So now, it, when you have this conversation with your family and colleagues in the community, your approach is going to be different when you talk about mass incarceration. You're not talking about these things that just happened recently. These are systemic, and they're ingrained in the black experience in this country. And that's a different conversation. Since wages were lower in the South than any other region, the labor needed to meet industrial demand trickled into the region. Southern industrialists were thus left with an indigenous labor force, which means that you can only get people in the South. So you have coal mining and ore mining. You have constructing roads. You have railroads. You have lumber. And you have drained swamps. All of these jobs are labor intensive. And I'm going to be honest with you. Think about how much money you would have to pay somebody to do that kind of work. They'd be like, you lost your mind. I mean, and, uh, and the mortality rate with, the, with those jobs is very high. But think about it for a second. If you own a company and you have workers that are dying, no big deal, just go out to the jail. You can grab some more and bring them on back. And that's how, they, that's how they treated black men. So the sad part about it is, if you left your house one day, and let's say it will be in Mississippi, and you, you kissed your wife and your children goodbye, you went off to work, there is a chance that you will never come back. Because before you can get back, you could be arrested for any fraud, fraudulent charge. Also understand this. For black men, you did not have to commit a crime. You only had to be accused of the crime. So that individual may never make it back to their house. And they don't have the ability to write to their families. 
So your wife and your children are waiting around for, for dad to come home, and he never does. Then when they finally find out what happened, that person could be locked up at, um, or working for a, com a labor company somewhere, and, and there's a good chance that person would probably perish um, based on hard labor. That is the black experience in America. Um, and I'm not making this up. In many cases, state officials profited personally from the lease system. Joseph E. Brown, governor of Georgia and the U.S. Senator, while serving the state of Georgia, Brown was able to obtain convicts for his coal mining company. So what you have is you have um, state and, and local officials who own prop these businesses, and they are, are making these laws to incarcerate more and more black men. They are enriching themselves while also being a state politician. And that's how you have not only, you find out today that you have not only prison or penitentiaries for, for profit, but you also have people who are buying um, stock in those penitentiaries. But this is something that's been going on for quite some time. There was also something at that time, at that particular period, called the whipping boss. The whipping boss was a, either a black man, in most cases it was a black man, believe it or not, guys, it wasn't a white person. And that person would punish um, um, the convicts for, for making, doing things wrong. But a whipping boss is very reminiscent of slavery. So slavery is still being maintained, but by a different name. So, by, um, here. So by 1860, from 1868 to 1908, there was the convict lease system. A black person would be arrested, he would be put in jail, a person would come and lease him, like he would lease furniture, bring him to the, to the company and work him to death, or possibly you might, if you were lucky, work your term and then be able to leave. But if it was at hard labor, it was probably a good chance you wasn't going to leave. That, that happened until 1908. In 1908, you have chain gangs. And if you're familiar with chain gangs, if you ever ride down the highway and you see young, um, predominantly black men in orange jumpsuits picking up trash and all that kind of thing, that's where that concept comes from. Chain gangs meant that you, you would take these African Americans, you would put them in chains, you would take them out, and they would do road construction, drain swamps, and they worked for the state. And so, again, that's a way of getting black labor for free. That's what it's, that's what it's designed to do. Um, you have county camps um, on a local level. You have state. Now, the federal government is not going to have a hand in this, although they know what's going on. So it's not like they no different than the, the federal government knew that Jews were being exterminated. They can't say they didn't know. They knew it. They just didn't do anything about it. Same thing with this. They knew what was going on, they just didn't care. But this is really important. So when you look at the, the criminal justice system in terms of punishment, originally in this country it started off as a penitentiary system, it moved to convict lease system, it went from there to chain gangs, and then it goes back to where it is today, the penitentiary system. And so in the 20th century, you have the penitentiary system, but what you see is that overwhelmingly you have African Americans who, who populate the criminal justice system and also our penitentiaries. Southern punishment in the 19th century has traditionally been equated with the punishment of black men, for they feel the penitentiary and the chain gangs. And by the way, I always tell my students, I, I specifically choose the pictures on my, my, my slides because I, I do believe pictures are worth a thousand words and that, I, and that the pictures I choose have a lot of meaning. And so, again, when you, when you look at these pictures, what I see is relatives, friends, people that we know that could be easily caught up in this kind of thing. This slide pretty much just talks again about how the economy was a, a, a huge factor. It says, um, while failing cotton prices and deteriorating economy, the rate at which black men were lynched, incarcerated, or sentenced to chain gangs rose. So the economy goes down, the incarceration for black men goes up. You need to remove them from society so they don't have to compete with others for jobs and opportunities. So it's very intentional, it's very planned. This is not anything that just happens organically. 
This lie here, it just pretty much talks about incarceration in the 20th, 21st century. The growth in the size of the minority population increases, the rate at which blacks are arrested for violent crime increases. Income inequality generates more substantial increases in the rate of property crimes. Again, poor people commit property crimes. Black people are disproportionately more poor than whites, but there are more poor white people than black people. So that's why, for instance, if you just say the word to a group of kids, um, um, somebody is poor, a lot of people automatically assume you're talking about black people based on that fact. But then those are the individuals that either commit property crimes or they're accused of property crimes. But again, what my argument, and I tell my students, black people don't, black poor people do not commit crimes, poor people commit crimes. Everybody. But, but unfortunately, people assume that uh, if you're black, you're automatically poor. What is he doing driving that car? Why is, he, why is she dressed that way? She can't afford that handbag. All of those sort of things. Today, the most vigorous pro prosecution and the harshest penalties are often reserved for blacks who perpetuate violence against whites, with leniency extended for blacks to, that who victimize fellow blacks. That statement that's, that's, that's relevant today is exactly the way slave codes were written. If a black person offended, assaulted, um, attempted to do anything to a white person, you could possibly lose your life. You can mur a black person at that in those days could also, um, um, if they murdered a black person, they may not get the same type of sentence. Now, if a black man murders someone's slave, what do you think would happen to that person? They'll probably lose their life. Why? Because you just destroyed someone's property. But if a black man murdered a free black man, guess what? No death. Nope. Matter of fact, do it again. Yes. And so, but, but, but again, but today, when a black person perpetuates a crime against a white person, the, the, the sentencing is much greater. And what I'm saying is that that's the way it always has been. This is not something that's new. And of course here, at the very bottom, you have incarceration rates of white men, black men, Hispanic, white female, and of course, as you can tell, the, the, the dark color is black men. But this is, there's a history behind that. Same thing here. Current patterns have historical roots, and one would expect black property offenders to be punished more severely than either violent offenders or white property offenders. This is so because blacks are more likely to cross racial lines when committing property crimes. So think about it for a second. And I know Father Bozeman has talked about this, and I think all of us are very, very concerned with young people bashing in windows and stealing and that kind of thing. Why do you think they go to the Lakeview area? They're going to a nice area because that's where the property is that they want. So that's what all this slide says, that these individuals, now granted, I'm not suggesting that they're poor, they, could, they may not be poor, who knows? But my point is that the individuals that's gonna be impacted by property crimes most often are people who have property. They, you don't go to a poor neighborhood where people ride the bus and try to rob them. You might be disappointed. Because they're working class people and they're, tr they're trying to get by just like everybody else. So, so that's what this slide says. It also says that as in the case today, violent crimes are more likely to be intraracial, which means, and I tell my students, white people kill white people and black people kill black people. Very rarely do you have black and white people killing each other. And that's the way it always has been. But the severity of the criminal sentencing goes to a black person who kills a white person, even though that's not the norm. I'm almost done. So today, black people, I mean, people of color make up 37% of the population. That's African Americans and Hispanics um, and Asians. But they make up almost 70% of the of prison population today. Overall, African Americans are more likely than white Americans to be arrested. Once arrested, they are more likely to be convicted. And once convicted, they are more uh, likely to face stiff sentencing. Black men are six times as likely to be incarcerated as white men, 
And today, in 2020, black men on average receive a 20% longer jail sentence than white males that commit the same crime. So what I'm saying, here we go, what I'm saying is that the things that are happening today are rooted in the past. So if you want to understand your current and present state, you have to learn about the past. And it bothers me when people don't know the past, especially people of color. Because our history and our culture was taken from us. And, it's, and now that we have the ability to know it and understand it and embrace it, we should be doing that. Our young people should be reading. They should be reading about their history. They should know their history. And they should not deal under, or embrace these negative racial stereotypes that are still propagated today. Um, that's why I went to uh, Xavier University. So, one of the things that Father Bozeman pointed out was, he said, and I'm only laughing, is because he said, we're going to discuss the, the issue of mass incarceration, but we're going to talk about solutions. And I'm thinking in my mind, okay, how do we do this? How do you solve a systemic uh, problem where the majority of the population benefits? Because I'll be honest with you, the mass incarceration of African Americans, it benefits the majority race. And when one group it has privilege, in other words, white privilege is not something that's just, just um, reflected with someone who's conservative, Republican, or um, someone who's um, 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 Democrat or whatever, or, or racist. White, white privilege is something that white people have regardless, whether you're well-meaning or not. And so often I would tell students that when we talk about not, even, not just conservatism, but liberalism, that when you have individuals from another community who go into the black community and want to tell the people in that community what's best for them, does that make any sense? Now, you, we could debate about is it possible for a, black, a white person to teach black history? We could even debate about is it possible for a white person to teach to mentor young black men and women. But what I would argue is, it's impossible for another person from a community to teach a black man or young black man or woman how to be a black man or woman. That's what I would argue. Because if you, if you don't live in that community, and you benefit from privilege, and you don't have the same experience, I don't know how you're gonna mentor our young people to get them in the right, in the right place in this society. But I don't, that doesn't mean that you can't educate them or support them. But it's a different conversation. So the way I look at it is this is a systemic problem that has gone on for 200 years. I don't see a, a silver bullet. You know? But what I will say is this, and I know Father Bolton would agree with me on this, I always tell my young people, vote. Because what we have to do is make sure that the people who, who support these injustices are not in political office, and the people that are going to address these injustices are in political office. And I'll just say this, and I've had this conversation many times. It, it, it breaks my heart the way the, the last national election occurred. Because our young people, and young people white and black, were so in love with Barack Obama, they grew up at a time or became of age when they voted for someone they really liked. So in the last national election, there were two people that people didn't really like. So what did a lot of young people say? I'm not voting for anybody. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm telling you some conversations I've had with my daughters and their friends. So what happens is when you don't vote, the person who should never be in office can get in office. And I've often told young people, I say, so what do you think black people used, have done all the way up throughout American history? Amen. They always had to vote for the person, the best of the worst. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. You may not have liked either one of them. In both candidates, we might use racial slurs. But you have to vote for somebody because somebody's going to be worse than the other person. And so we have to vote. And that's the way that I see that you would address some of these inequities in an in a unfair criminal justice system. Beyond that, we have to educate our young people to know our history and to know how to respond when they are stopped by the police. And I'll, I'll say this and I'll wrap up. I had a quick conversation with my students. We were talking about the movie Queen and Slim. 
And I asked one of my students, I said, you know, there was one part in the movie that I really liked that I that kind of resonated with me. And I don't know if you guys saw the movie. Um, and me and Becky, my wife, also saw uh, Just Mercy last week, which we absolutely love. Um, but there was a part where um, there was the black mechanic that was fixing their car. And he, he looks at both of them and he says, I think, he, uh, I don't know if he was talking to Queen or Slim, but he looks at him and says, why didn't you just take the ticket? Just take the ticket. Yeah. You know? And I remember saying that to one of my young students, and she said, well, no, Dr. Cox, you know, that was unfair, and that wasn't right. And she was just speaking her mind, and this and that. And I said, I understand that. But the difference is, if you take the ticket, you can always fight the ticket. If, you, if the situation escalates to a point, you may not ever have a chance to fight it. Because what can happen is that person can say, I felt threatened, and shoot you. And I said that, that what, when I see on TV that you have the police that are literally physically fighting and beating down someone because they're resisting, to me, you know, and again, I'm 54 years old, so I mean, uh, I, I still look at it from the standpoint, it's much smarter for you to leave um, and fight for another day than it is for you to resist and possibly lose your life. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. And I tell my students, it's not about right or wrong all the time. It's about the way you fight injustice. Because there's all kinds of ways to do it. You don't have to do it right then at that particular point. Um, and what happens is it gives license to people to use excessive force on you and you might lose your life. But then again, I always tell my students, I like to learn from you. I don't have all the answers. I'll tell you what I think and you tell me what you think. But the black community needs to have these discussions with our young people so they don't end up being murdered um, by the, a, a, a rogue police officer. And I've often said this, I don't believe that police officers are bad. I believe that the vast majority of all police officers are good. But I also know that there's systemic racism Amen. in all types and forms in different institutions. And I also know that there are people that should not be police officers in our, in our, in our uh, law enforcement. Amen. But I, I would never put all of them in the category to say they're all bad, because I don't believe that. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the lecture.